Hello everyone, this is lecture four. And the goal for today is mostly to talk about functions. So let me tell you what functions are. <clears throat> so before I start, I should say that uh, today's uh, slides are, today's slides are borrowed from previous years, uh, but these are slides by, by Mariam. Thank her for the slides. So what are functions? So in math, <coughs> Uh, we are used to having functions in math, right? For example, a typical functions f of x equals x squared. So it takes an input and it returns an output. So an input in this case would be x, for example, x equals five. And we have an output that will be in this case, x squared. So if x equals five, the function returns x squared. We have something similar in programming. We'll also write functions and functions will take inputs and will return outputs, or maybe sometimes they will do something else they will return results. And why are functions useful? So basically, uh, they typically reduce complexity of problems and allow us to reduce, to reuse our code. We will see exactly what this means, uh, but to say, it, uh, to say something about it, usually when we have a large uh, program that we want to write, we don't write it all in one, sort of on one, in, uh, in one block of code, just like, like we did so far. Instead, we break it into smaller sub-problems. We solve each sub-problem separately, and then we use the, we so solve this sub-problem using functions, and then we use these functions to solve the, the, the larger part of the problem, the, the, the entire program. And functions are useful because they allow the programming to be more modular and allow the debug debugging to be easier. We will see all this uh, when we see a couple of examples, then this will make more sense. You should go back to this slide after we see a few examples. And I would like to say that we have already seen quite a few functions in Python. Um, let me give you some examples of this. So the first function that we uh, that we saw was the print function. So here is your print function. We use it as follows. We write print, and then in parentheses we give the arguments. So let me write print is a function that gets an argument and prints it to the screen. So in this case, in this case, the argument is the string testing types. Uh, here is let let let's try to let's try to run this code, and we'll do it using a debugger for it at this time. Okay, so we printed the first line, testing types. Um, we saw another function that's called type. And what does type do? Type gets uh, an object or, or a variable, x. Sorry, it gets a variable and it returns the type of this variable or of this object. Okay, so in this case, t of x is we apply the function type on x and it returns the type of X and then we can print it, right? Then we use the function print again and it prints uh, the type of X. So it says the type of X, X equals 32. The type of X is, well, this is the type of X. This is TX. Okay. And while we're here along the way, I will show you how types, how casting works. So what is casting? Casting means we take a string, for example, or we take one type and we convert it into another type. In this case, we took type, we took a, a, a string and we convert it into int. How? Again, we use a function, it's a special function called int that takes a string and converts it into an int. Here is another example. We take of casting, we take 3.99, which is not an integer. And int converts it into an integer. How? Well, apparently it does rounding down, so y will be three. When we print it, 
it will print y equals t. And the type of y is int, right? Although we started at 3.99, which is not an int, this function, it's a special function called int, converted a float into an integer. Right? And now y has type int. So we use functions all the time. Int is a function, type is a function, print is a function. All these are functions. Today we will learn how to write our own functions, but for now I want to say that we use functions all the time. Okay. Let's try another example. If we start with negative 3.2 and we we'll apply the function in, int on it, then we get a variable z of type int. And when we print it, the value will be negative three. Uh, you know, we could also try to write something int of hello, but hello doesn't look like an int, so it, right, it, it's really not a number. So when we try to do this, the, the function, the, the program will, will stop and will say, oh, there is an error. I cannot convert the string hello into a number. Okay. Uh, let's apply the function print again. This will put these, these lines. And we'll try a few more examples. So we can also convert numbers from ints to float. Okay? So uh, if we take number three and we convert it to float, so float reaches 3.0, which is effectively the same as three, but the type is different. The type of, of F1 is float, is not an int. Again, if we take 3.9 as a string, we can convert it into a float, right? So this one converts an, a string into a float. And again, just as before, if we want to write something that's not a string, uh, sorry, that's not a number and convert it into a number, it would say there's an error. Please try it, okay? So uncomment this line and run the code, see what happens. We can also convert things in the other direction. For example, we can take str of three, right? str is another function. It takes a number and, and returns a string. And the type of S1 is a string, okay? So S1 is not the number three, it's three in quotation marks, a string, right? Or S2, it's also a string. And this one, well, it gets a string, it returns a string, so it doesn't do much really. So here we go, we got all these strings. So here we saw two examples. First, we saw that we can convert from one type to another using these, these constructors or these functions called int or float or str. And two, we saw that, yeah, we use the functions all the time. Okay. So type is one name of a function and it gets any object, a number, a string, anything and it returns its type. It returns the name of this type. All right. So this is the name of the function and in parentheses we have the arguments to the function. All right. And we saw some more predefined functions. For example, we work with these ints and floats and converted strings. We saw some predefined functions. Okay. Uh, let's try some more examples. Uh, let me comment things out for now and let's try one more example. Uh, here's what I want to do. I would like to take some number, let's say 10. And I would like to compute its square root. So how do I do it? Well, I need to write B equals SQRT of A. So what's SQRT? SQRT is a function. Again, it's a function that takes a number and it returns its square root. 
and B will contain the square root of A. Okay, so in this case, B is this 3.16. Yeah, we can print it. So we apply several functions here. We apply the function square root and we apply the function print. Oh yeah, and I should say that square root is not just, it's, it's a standard function, but it appears in the library math. We saw it already. We saw already libraries last time when we used math, when we used random. So if we want to use square root, we need to use, uh, we need to declare it. And how do we declare it? We say from math import the function square root. This is the line. But let's say I want to, I want to use more from, right? Maybe I want to compute uh, uh, C, the, the function seeding. So the function seeding gets a number and it rounds the number up to the nearest integer. Okay. So I could also write something like import seal. And if I want to compute the function power, uh, power means raise two to the power six or logarithm compute the logarithm of 64 to the base two. Sure, I could write all these functions, but it's kind of not very convenient. So what we do instead is we simply write import asterisk, and then it imports all functions from uh, from the library math. Okay, and then we can run line by line. So this computes the square root. Now we take a, note that I use this, reuse the same variable a, okay? So at this point, a forgets about 10, now a becomes 7.8. And I compute the ceiling of a. So what's the ceiling of a? It's rounded up to the nearest integer. So it will become eight, I suppose. Yeah, b will be eight and I print, it prints the seal of 7.8 is eight. If I want to compute log to the base two of 64, uh, so what's locked the base two of 64? It's which power of two gives us 64. So that's exactly six, right? Because two to the six is equal to 64. Another example, power. So X will be two to the power six. So two times two times two, six times, that's 64. Okay. So what are the two examples? So what are the examples that we saw? We saw examples of functions. Some of them take only one argument. Some of them take two arguments. We can take, give it three arguments. Print allows to take either one argument or two arguments, or even in this case, one, two, three, four. So the arguments are separated by commas. Okay. That's, uh, that's another example of using functions. Right, and we said that uh, if we want to import from this math library more than one function, we can say import star. Yeah, and there are more examples of a function seal and floor, and we saw square root and log, and we saw the exponentiation function. Right, and we could also, for exponentiation, we can also uh, be using star star notation, uh, two to the power six is equal to the power six. And if we run it, it will also give 64. So, two to the power six is the same as pow to six. Okay, that, that's another example. Okay, um, so, so just to say it again, so what's a function call? So we write the name of the function and in parentheses we write the argument and the output returns some value and we get this value using this uh, equal operator. The function doesn't have to return a value. For example, print doesn't return anything, but it can return a value. And functions can get more than one argument. So it gets one, two, three, four, five arguments. The same function, right? Print can get either one argument, two arguments or more. Square root takes only one argument. 
and the arguments are separated by commas. Okay. Uh, we saw another example. Let me not show it in the code, but it will be an exercise for you. Uh, the, the example was random. So there's a, a library called random or a module called random. And we saw <laughs> this example. What was the example? The example was to use the function random. So the function random with parentheses, right? If you want to say, even if it gets no arguments, we still need to put parentheses. And this function returns a random number between zero and one. Uh, try running this example. Mm -hmm. So what this example does, let's try to read it. So first we import, then we say i equals zero, and then we say while i is less than 10, get a random number, put it into x, print x, and then increment i. So print x, I think this is from old version of Python. Now we put x in parentheses because print is just a standard function. Okay, so we put print, so there should be parentheses here. We increment i by one, we go to the, to the beginning of the while loop. Okay, i is less than 10, so we'll print another number and another number and another number. We print all 10 numbers, and then when i equals 10, we exit the loop. Okay, try this example. But here we all, the point here is that we also use this function called run. Okay, so it's another function that we use. We use functions all the time. Uh, this module random also has rand int and rand int uh, has also functions rand, uh, rand int returns an, a, an integer between five and 10. Okay, so in the previous example, random returns a number between zero and one and rand int returns an integer between five and 10. Okay. okay. Uh, how about the following? Uh, practice exercise. So write a program that asks a user to call, uh, to, to guess a number that will be rolled on a six-sided die. Okay, so we roll a die and the, the user needs to guess the output. Let's see, I actually have it already prepared. But then we'll try to put it in a function. Mm -hmm. So here is what we do. We first ask the user to guess the number. So ask the user to guess a number. Then we roll the die. And we say, here, this is the outcome. The outcome of the this is the result. What we get in the die. If the guess is correct, we say yeah, you won. Congrats. Another way you say yeah, you lost. Let's try this game. I don't know. Open three. The outcome is two. Nah, I lost. Let's try again. Maybe I'll try one, two now. The outcome is one. I lost again. Oh no. No, five. The outcome is three. Okay, I lose every time. Uh, but here, here is the thing. To run the program more than once, every time I need to run it again and again. How about we write a function? This function will be called uh, play a single game. And it, and what we can do in the so in the body of the uh, of our program, we call this function several times. We call it, let's say, four times. I'm not saying this is the best way to write it, but it is a way to write. It. Okay, so we call it. We run it four times. And let's see what happens now. 
So what will happen is we'll call the function once and then call the function twice and then third time and then fourth time. Okay, so we'll write, call the function four times. This part will not be executed. When we write def, it's a definition of our function and everything inside needs to be, will be called when we call this function. So here, calling the function. Let's try to run it. I don't know, four. Sorry, you lost. Two, six. I somehow lose every time. I don't know why. Um, how can we reduce this? So yeah, I wrote it four times, but it's kind of, you know, maybe I could write, write some, for something like for I in range, I don't know, five. So this means I play the game four times, okay? So uh, this is the main body of the program. It calls the function Let's try to run it now. Maybe I'll be lucky this time. One. Yes, I won. Amazing. Two. No, I lost. Okay, run it five times. Uh, let's make it even more, you know, kind of restricting it to five, five times sounds a bit too restrictive. What if I want to play 10 times or I want to play uh, only once? So here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to declare a variable called continue, cont. Uh, it is true if I want to continue and false if I want to stop. Okay. And then I'll, I'll write while we want to continue. So remember the while loop says, if what's written inside is true, we'll play the game. And then we'll ask the user, do you want to continue and let's say they need to output yes or no. And if answer is equal no, then continue becomes false. And you know, otherwise uh, continue stay remains true. Let's try it now. We're on the program. I don't know, I'm guessing five. The outcome is six, you lost. Do you want to continue? So let's say this time I want to press yes. Okay, call it again, three. The outcome is four, do you want to continue? Yes. Uh, two. Yeah, you won. Okay, I want to stop, I press no. So here is what you see here. It, it's sort of a, already a very nice example of how functions are used. This is the main body of the function, of the program. And what it says, it says there's a while loop. We play the game and then we check if we want to continue or not. It's very simple. If we didn't have function, that then the entire body of the play single game would need to we would need to put it here, which would make the code look kind of you know unreadable. It would be really hard to read this code. But here the code is super simple. We declare a variable cont that says if we want to continue or not, and we have a loop, and the body of the program is very simple. 
Okay, so I hope this example demonstrates why functions are useful, right? We hide all the logic all the logic related to playing a single game into this uh, inside this function, and then we just say play a single game. No, call the function just once. Okay. I hope this is uh, this is clear. Okay, here is a practice problem for you. Write a program called rock, paper, scissors. Uh, you generate a random number. Let's say zero will be rock, one will be scissors, and two will be paper. And then you ask the user, do you, do you choose rock, paper, scissors? And then you print if you win or lose, if you want or lose. Okay. And try using exactly the same logic. So the only difference will be will be play single game, right? The only difference will be play single game. You now to need to implement the logic of rock, paper, scissors and not logic of, of guessing of guessing a number. Okay, so it's also right, so it makes everything very modular in the sense that oh, I need this part, I can keep I can keep the entire body of the main program as the main body of the program as is and change only the game that we're playing. I hope this is helpful. I hope you understand what I mean. Okay, so we already saw how to define our own functions, right? How do we define our own functions? You yeah, know, this is how we define it. We we'll say we write def and then so this function gets no arguments. This function gets no arguments and doesn't return anything the function implements the logic of the game uh, yes a number i know it's not a very exciting game but you know i i hope it it gives you uh the idea of what the function looks like. So the function gets no arguments and doesn't return anything. Let me give you the next example. Mm, here is an example. Let's say I want to compute the volume of a cylinder. So what's a, what's a cylinder? So it's this geometric 3D geometric shape. And how do I compute the volume of a cylinder? So there are two two parameters. One is the height and one is the radius. And area, area of the base is pi times r squared. And the volume is height times the red, times the area of the base. So overall, we compute the area of the base, which is pi r squared, and multiply it by the height. OK. So here is, let me raise it. Uh, I want to compute the, vol the volume of a cylinder, and I give it two arguments. The arguments are R, R, um, radius, and H height. And here is what I would like to do. I would like to say first that area is equal to, uh, I guess, I would like to say mass dot pi times r squared times r times r. And then volume is equal to area times h. And I return both. So this line, the function returns the result and exits. And I'll remind you, this is the main body of our program. This needs to be called in order to, to if we want to run it. 
let's again see an example of this. Let's run it line by line. Right, so you saw, let me stop it and do it again. When I run the debugger, it sees, oh, that's a function. I'm not, go I'm not going inside, I'm going to the main body of our program. Okay, so first give me the radius. Let's say radius is, I don't know, D. Give me the height. Let's say height is five. Now I have a button called step into, it's F7. Step into will go inside the function. We first compute the area, then we multiply area by H. The volume is, well, this number, and we return the volume. When we return, this variable gets whatever the function returned. Okay, so here volume is 141 point something. We print the volume. Okay, let's try to run it without the without debugger. One, two, that's the result. Okay. So again, the example shows a function that gets two arguments, two numbers. It does some computation, returns another number. And we get the return value into this variable, how using uh, using this equal operator. In fact, all these are functions. Input is a function that gets a string, and what it returns is whatever the user put to the, whatever user entered. Int, it's a function that gets whatever the argument has and converts it into an int. Maybe it makes more sense to turn it into a float, just in case the radius is not an integer number. For example, the, the, the radius is 3.1, and this is 4.0, this will still work. Well, if it was an int, the program would probably crash, right? So if this was an int, for example, if we insist that the radius is an int and we put, I don't know, 1.5 here, the program will crash. It will say, oh no, we expect an int, but we get 1.5. So how about we change it to float? Okay. Right, so one thing to say, the order of the parameters matter. If it says here R goes first and H goes after it, it means to put the radius first and the height after that. We should not change the order that, you know, what we really put here is numbers, right? Three and five. So if we put them in a different order for the function, there's no way to guess. There's no way to guess that the, uh, which one is the height and which one is the radius. So, so just to, to explain, right, the order radius goes to R, H goes to H, what we return V, when we when the function returns, it turns this V, it goes to the return value. Okay. Here's a practice problem for you. Write the function that computes N factorial. So your function gets an argument N that should return N factorial. You know what? I'm going to just start it for you. Or how about we do it together? Okay, so for debugging, we simply write, let's say, I don't know, x equals five. So how do we write an n factorial? 
So let's define a function called result. It will be in the beginning will be one, and we'll just return the result. Uh, so what do we need to do? So we need to multiply one times two times three up to times n. Oh, and it says zero factorial is zero. So let's let's just get rid of this silly case. If n is zero, simply return one. Otherwise, uh, from now on, assume n is greater. In fact, if n is equal one, we can also return one. Right, so let's assume that n is greater two, and here's what we do. Uh, so what do we do? For i in range up to, well, n plus one, y, range n plus one corresponds to, I want to start from one. Uh, one, two, three, up to n. For i in range. I want to take the result and I want to multiply it by i. Let's see. What happens when I run it? Three factorial is equal to six. Four factorial is equal to twenty-four. Now, and it's it's having having this factorial is actually very convenient because I can simply change x to be five, three, or five, or seven, and for each of them, I simply run print factorial. Right, you can imagine what kind of a mess it would be if I needed to write this entire logic every time. Instead, I'm hiding this logic once, right? I'm writing it once, and then I'm simply using this factorial. Right, I use this function factorial. So when x equals three, factorial is six. When x plus five, it's one twenty. When x when x equals seven, yeah, this is a factorial. Okay. That's another example. So this is how you compute n factorial. <coughs> Let's write another program, and this program will be called exponent. So here is what exponent does. Uh, okay, let me comment out the logic for now and hide it somewhere. And, and then, then we'll get back to it, okay? Then we'll write it ourselves. So again, exponent is, is a stand, so this is the same as math.pow, but our goal is to practice writing functions, okay? So we could simply use, so, so we could simply return math.pow base power, and that would work, right? Let's even try it. We need to do import math or We could do import math and that would work. Okay, so here, here is here is the body of the function. So it says b will be the base, enter the base number, then p will be uh, the exponent, so that's the power. And then we return b to the power p is exponent. Let's try to run it just to see what it's supposed to do. 
let's say basis three to the power two, the result is nine. Okay, let's try again. I don't know, maybe two to the power five, the result is 32. Okay, that's very good. But you know, th that's that's cheating. I, I don't want this. Uh, I, I want to actually write, write the code. So here is what I'm going to do. So I'll have I'll have a base case, I'll have sort of uh, an annoying case. If base is zero, then we simply return zero. So let's sort of get rid of the, the easy case. Uh, so from now on, assume that base is, is not zero. So there are two cases. So if power is greater than zero, what do we need to do? So here's what we'll do. Uh, so we'll start with result equals one. And okay, so let me copy it and then we'll see exactly what's going on. Here's what's happening. We're going to multiply bay, so we start with result equals one, and then we multiply the result by base, how many times, power many times. You know, we could do it using a for loop, we could do it using a while loop, this time we'll just do it using a while. Okay, so we start with i equals zero, and as long as i is less than power, we multiply result by base, and then we increment i by one. Okay, so, uh, if, for example, if power equals three, we multiply, we start with result equals one and multiply result by base three times. All right, so, uh, so in the end result, is equal base times base times base. Okay. But what if power is negative? Uh, you know what? If power is zero, then it's it will be the same thing. So we'll no, not go into the loop. The result will be just one. What if power is negative? Okay. Uh, if power is less than zero, then we need to uh, we need to do division. For example, two to the power minus three is equal uh, one half. Times one half times one half. Right. So we do the same thing, except that we don't multiply, but we divide. So result will not be multiplied by base, but rather it will be divided by base. So that's our function exponent. If power is positive, then we just multiply. And if power is negative, then we, right, when we say to the power minus three, to the power negative three, what we do is we start with one and we divide by two and divide by two and divide by two. Let's try it around. If the base number is, for example, two and the exponent is five, aha. Uh -huh. And here is one thing I forgot. And in the end, we need to return result, right? I didn't do it, so it said the power is none. And it kind of surprised me. Let's try it now. Two to the power of five. The result is 32. On the other hand, if we take three to the power negative two, 
we get a one. Why are we getting a one? We're getting a one. Well, the reason we're getting a one, uh, I suspect is because we need to make it into a float. Two to the negative three. No, it still doesn't work. So what doesn't work here? Okay, if something doesn't work, I think it's a good example. Yeah, we'll do debugging. We'll do debugging, and here is what we do. All right, we enter the first number, two, second number, negative three. And now we'll go into the exponent. So there's a button step into that's F7 for me. Is base zero? No, it's not zero. Is power positive? No, the power is negative. We start with the result being one. Oh, I see. So power is negative, but we're still going, we are incrementing i. So is i less than power? Power is negative three, i is zero. So we exit it. Aha. Uh -huh. So the problem was power was negative. So what we need to do is we need to ch change the direction, right? So power, uh, remember, here power is less than zero. So we start with i equals zero and increase it. Mm -hmm. Let's try it now. Two to the power negative three. That's one over eight, that's 0 0.125. Mm -hmm. That's our program for computing the exponent. And as you can see, this function has two parts. One is the positive part and one is the negative part. Um, but sort of, I would like to say, look, these two parts have exactly the same logic. So how about we write version two and in version two, uh, we'll write only the case of greater or equal zero. And for the case greater or equal zero, we can simply implement this part. Uh, if it's a positive power, then we can simply implement this part. So if power, power is positive, then we return exponent power positive base power. What if the power is negative? What do we need to do then? So here is what we can do. We can uh, okay. We'll have a temporary variable that will compute of negative power, and then we'll return one divided by ten. Okay. So now you see that I broke one function into su a smaller sub function that says, if power is positive, just use this helper function. And if power is negative, then 
turn the function to it, turn the power to be positive for a second and then return one divided by this. And let's see if it works. Two to the power of three, that's eight. I don't know, three to the power of four, that's 81. That's correct. What about two to the power of negative two? That's 0 0.25. What about three to the power of negative two? That's 0 0.111. That's one divided by nine. All seems to work. So we'll use the uh, function as a helper. Mm -hmm. So to compute the exponent, you know, we call this function, but inside the logic says you can use only positive power and then do one divided. Okay, so please see this example, uh, maybe one more time and try to understand it. <clears throat> okay, uh, here is a review question. What do you think will be the value returned by this function? So, right, there's a function called sample, it gets no arguments, it says result 35, then return result plus five. So, and then it says increment result by 10. What do you think is the correct answer? Okay, so you should run and see what's the correct answer, but let me tell you, the correct answer will be 40. Okay, 40 is the correct answer. Why? Because we start with 35, then we do result plus five, that's 40. This is what's being returned. And this line will never be executed because when we run, after return, nothing happens. The function exits, okay? So return means I return the value and then I exit. Nothing happens. So the return value is 40 and then the result just, this line is never executed. Okay, what will happen here? Let's see. Uh, we define my function. It says equal, x equals 10, and it prints the value 10. Um, do I have... Uh... Okay, I'll have I'll have a couple of examples, but let's first do it here. And here I declare x equals 20, and then I call my function. And then I'm printing this. So here's what will happen. When we try to run it, let me just, here is what will happen. What will happen is that we'll go inside the function my func, x equals 10, it will print 10. It will not remember this 20. It will remember the value of the local variable x. When it exits, it's, it forgets about this local x and it prints this x. So it will first print 10 and then it will print 20. And the reason is as follows. We have scope of variables. Whatever we have variable inside the function, it's a local variable and it's not affected by anything outside. Okay, so this x is a local variable. It only lives inside the function. It doesn't live outside. This x is in the global scope. It's in the main body of the function. And whatever happens to the local variables is independent of this, right? So you can think of this as global x, and this is local x for my function. So first we'll print 10, then we'll print 20. So scope of variable is the portion of the program or the function where the variable lives. And the lifetime of a variable is the period throughout the variable exists. So this variable exists only as long as we're inside the, 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 the function. When we exit the function, this x disappears. This x lives throughout, throughout the entire program, but when we are inside the function, this guy shadows over this guy, right? The local variable becomes, becomes the main one. So this X, we don't see it. Okay, so we have local variables and global variables. 
global variables are visible everywhere. Let me let's try to to run this. Uh, let's see a few examples. Okay. So okay, let's let's try to look at this code. So first we have a global variable a. If a equals zero, we declare b equals one. Oh, this function is kind of in the middle. It's not very nice to put it there, but sure, let's put it. Um, and then we have local variable c. That's an argument that c equals seven, d equals three. We print c equals seven, d equals three. When we exit our function, A and B still exist, right? These are global variables, A and B. We can print them and we'll get their values, A equals zero and B equal. Let me, let me okay, let me debug it again. Okay. We declare a and b. Yeah, we call this function. It printed c and d, and then we print a. A is still zero. B is still one. B is still one. Good. But if I want to print c and d, what will happen? No, it complains here. You see, it already has underlined. It says un unresolved reference c. Why? Because Because, because the scope of C and D is only inside uh, my function. They do not exist outside my function. Okay, so I'm going to comment them out so things don't compile. Mm -hmm. So that's our first example. Okay, so what we need to understand is that C and D only live inside my function and do not live outside. Let's try another example. Okay, so this example is sort of more interesting. I declare x equals 99, y equals 17. I declare these two functions, fun one and fun two. Let's go inside each one. When I go inside each of them, x is a local variable, right? It's an argument. And y is also a local variable. It's not the same y as here. So when I set this guy to be 100, it's the local variable that's set to be 100. When I print it, it prints x equals 77, y equals 100. Okay. When I go inside fun two and I try to print x and y, what happens? X is a local variable, I passed it 77, but y, oh, y is a global variable. So what will, what will it print? It will print 77 and, and 17. When I leave both of these functions, it prints the global variable. Right, so here it prints the values of the global variables. Okay. Usually we should try avoiding using the same name inside and outside. Sometimes it's, it's, it's impossible, sometimes we don't know, but we should try avoiding it whenever possible. So please play with this example. Try you know, some more similar examples and see, see how it goes.
Um, right, so we see this example here. So in this case, again, just to emphasize it, X and Y here are local variables. So when they're printed from inside fun, it will print 77 and 100. When it printed from outside, it will print 99 and 17, right? It will print the values of the global variables here, but the local variables there. While here, Y refers to the global variable and X is still the argument, it's still the local variable. Here is something you should not do usually. You should not declare a new variable inside the condition. So if X is greater than zero, you declare Y. Yeah, here it will work. But if X happens to be less than zero, then this line will crash because it will say, oh, I don't know what's what. So please don't do this kind of things. Okay, so. Right, so in this example, what will happen? If I want X to be less than zero, declare Y to be 17. What will happen? The program will crash. It will say Y is not defined because it was never assigned. So my point is don't do it. Uh, can you tell me what's the output of this program? So we define a function, then we set x equals three, and then we say if c greater than two, yes, this holds. D is my function of five. So we pass five into a. B equals five minus two, that's three, three times three. What will it print? Yeah, it should print three, I think. But what are the scopes? C is a global variable, D is a global variable, A and B are local variables. Okay, good. Let me do two more examples with you and then we'll be done for today. Two more examples are, uh, so last time we had this program called check, file, check palindrome. If you remember, check palindrome, it takes a string. Let me, let me run you this. I don't know, A, B, C, D, C, D, A. And it says it's a palindrome. And if I do X, Y, Z, Y, it says it's not a palindrome. Well, you know, it's kind of nice. But if I want to run it more than once, that, that would be kind of, you know, not very convenient. Let's say I want to run, I want to say enter, enter a string and then do cleanup and then say if it's a palindrome or not. But then I want to do it twice, for example, for two strings, or I want to do it several times, right? I want to do it several times until I tell it to stop. Then it would not be very convenient. So here's the way we, we will fix it. Uh, we'll take a function of, uh, I don't know, call it line. And here is what we're going to do. We're going to move this entire this entire logic into uh -huh. so we're going to move this entire logic into a function and we'll see next part. Uh, so one thing it's complaining is the name of the function is the same as the name of the variable. Let's change it just this far. Okay. So remember the first part is cleaning. We'll, we'll remove the cleaning. Or we'll remove the print, but we'll keep the cleaning. This is is palindrome or is not. And in the end, what we'll do is we'll return is palindrome returns true or false. Okay. And here is the main body, right? So this is the main body of the program. So now it's sort of very, the, the main body now is very clean. We take text, we ask, is it palindrome or not? If it's palindrome says yes, if not say no. Why is it convenient? 
because we can apply the same logic as we did before with this, uh, with, with repeating things several times. And let me tell you what I mean by this. What I mean by this is we'll have a loop that takes the text, says if it's a palindrome or not, and then we ask, do you want to continue to another string? And then another string. So the main body is actually very clean, right? This part says, this is take the text and say if it's yes or no. And then ask, do you want to go to the next one? Okay. Let's try to run it and see if it works. I don't know, A, B, C, D. It's not a palindrome. Do you want to continue? Yes. Uh, X, Y, X, Y, X. Yes, it is a palindrome. Do you want to continue? Well, let's say no. Okay. So again, you see, it's, I'm kind of showing the same example, but I think it's, it's, a, it's a nice example to see. There's several times that we're seeing, uh, that we're calling the same function, and instead of you know putting this entire logic of the function here inside the loop and making it very hard to read, now reading is sort of very easy, right? This part says, take the text, check if it's palindrome or not and print yes, no, and then go to the next string if you want. Okay, uh, that's all I'll say for today. There were two more examples that I wanted to do, but I think I will. Yeah, sure. Let's do one more example. So I will actually reuse this one. So here's what I want to do. So last time we also checked if a number is prime or not. And I would like to write a program that gets a number from the user and tells if the number is prime. Uh, So we'll ask, enter a number. And so here's the main body of the program again. We ask for a number. If it's prime, we say it's prime. If it's not prime, we say not prime. And then we we want to continue to the next number. And what's left to do is to write the, the logic for, for is prime. So how do we do that? Uh, so I'll leave it to you as an exercise. Uh, Use the uh, program we wrote in a previous lecture. Pretty sure we did it in the previous lecture. Is this is this true? Maybe we did it in lecture three. Check if number is prime. Yeah, we did it in lecture three. In lecture three, to uh, write. Okay implement this, you can use the program from we, we wrote in lecture three as a Okay, so that's, that's an example you will need to write. Okay, so that was about telling if a number is prime or not. So the only thing is missing is to implement this part. So for now I just return false, but you know sometimes you return true and sometimes you will return false. One thing I didn't write is my SQRT function, which is uh, um, you know what, let's do it now. Okay, so So here is what I want. Uh, here is the goal. I would like to uh, writing our own SQRT function. 
we could use math.sqrt, but we want to write one ourselves. The reason we want to do it is, you know, someone wrote this function. So maybe when you get a job, you get another right, right to work on some other programming language, and then they will tell you, oh, you need to write the SQRT function. Then you will say, oh, I know how to do it. And let me make a simplifying assumption. And the simplifying assumption will be that uh, I want to compute square root only of positive numbers. Here's an idea. Um, so here's an idea. We start, we will have uh, two bounds on our answer. And the bounds will be sort of the upper bound and the lower bound. In the beginning, the lower bound will be one and upper bound will be x. And we know that the answer is somewhere between one and x, right? For example, if x equals nine, then three is somewhere between one and nine. And here's what we'll do. So this is these two lines. As long as these two bounds are too far apart, we will try to bring them together. And when they become really close, how close? Well, let's say up to 0 0.0001, then we'll stop. Okay. Uh, so while the upper and lower bounds are far apart. Okay. So how far more than E? So E is sort of our error, right? So while the high is lower, is greater than low plus error is more than 0 0.001, here's what we do. Take the midpoint. So we take one and nine, and we take the midpoint, 4.5. And then we ask, is the correct answer more than 4.5 or less? How do we know? You know, we take mid, we take this 4.5, raise it square and ask, is it more than X or less than X? If it's more than X, it means that our midpoint is too large. Oh, so one is here, nine is here, 4.5 is here, but the answer is in between. So what do we do? We update high, we push, high to the midpoint. Okay. But if, for example, we do it again, right? We have one and one and 4.5. When we take the, 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 the midpoint, it will be 2 point something, 2.25. 2.25 is too small. So in this case, we'll put the low, we'll push the low to, toward the, the clo closer to the, sorry, we'll, we'll set the low to be the midpoint. Let me try uh, to give you an example. And as an example, I'm going to put debugging, right? So add uh, debugging at print or debugging. OK, let's try to run it. And let's do it, for example, with C. Okay, so here's what happens when we do it with three. So we start with, oh, sorry, not with three, with nine. So we start with one and nine. And then we take the midpoint of one and nine. So the midpoint of one and nine is five. Is five, five squared, is it more than nine or less than nine? Yes, it's more than nine. So we need to push the lower bound closer. So now the answer is between three and four. Sorry, between three and five. Now we take the midpoint of three and five. Hmm. What's the midpoint of three and five? It's four. Four, is it more than the correct answer or less than the correct answer? You know, the correct answer is four squared is more than nine. So in this case, we'll put 
push the, the, the we'll, we'll take the uh, the upper bound and we'll make it lower. We'll change it to four. That maybe it's not a good example. Maybe it will be a bit more convenient with sixteen. Okay, so we start with one and sixteen. So the correct answer should be four, right? But we take the midpoint of these two and it's 8.5. Which of the two boundaries should we replace? The one and 16, the 8.5 is sort of in the middle, but the correct end, when we take 8.5 squared, it's too large, which means we need to push the higher bound. We need to push high to the midpoint. So now we reduce the interval of our guess by one half. Okay, now we take one and 8.5, and we'll compute their midpoint. So their point midpoint is this 4.75. And then we ask 4.75, is it more than the answer or less? Well, if we take 4.75 squared, that's more than 16. Oh, if it's more than 16, then we need to push it even lower, right? So instead of 8.5, we'll take this one. What's the next midpoint? The next midpoint is this. Right, that's that's kind of the, the average of these two numbers. This number is too small, so we're going to update the lower bound and so on. So in each step, we update the lower bound and the, the upper bound. Maybe it would be slightly more convenient. Maybe we'll do it like this. Okay, so each time we have upper bound, lower bound, and midpoint. And the question, should we change the upper bound to be the midpoint or should we change the lower bound to be the midpoint? That's exactly what I want. So we have the upper bound and lower bound. Midpoint is 8.5. 8.5 is more than the correct answer. Why? Because 8.5 squared is too large. So we update the higher bound, the, the upper bound. Here we do again, we compute the average of these guys. The midpoint is 4.75. That's too large. We again update the upper bound. Now the midpoint is 2.8. Oh, 2.875 is too small because when you take it squared, is less than 16. So what do we do? We update the lower bound. So we, in each step, we bring bring together the upper bound and the lower bound. We bring them closer and closer and closer and closer until in the end, they become very close. So the result of all this computation, let me remove the debugging part, is 3.999995. Well, the correct answer is four. So, how far are we from the correct answer? This far. If we reduce the error even low, even small, make it even smaller, then the answer will be even closer to four, right? And if we add even more zeros, it will be even closer and so on. Okay, so this was a slightly advanced example. Uh, I still hope you are able to understand the idea. The idea, right, is to have upper bound, lower bound, and each time we take a midpoint and we sort of reduce our interval by checking whether midpoint is too large or too small. If the midpoint is too large, we update one of them. If the midpoint is too small, we update the lower bound. Okay, uh, that's all I have for today. Let me give you a couple of exercises. So there were some exercises uh, in the slides, you should also do them, but here are some exercises, some new exercises. So write a function, it's a simple function that gets the length and the width of a rectangle and computes the area of a rectangle. So this should be the signature. So again, write the code and also test the function. How do you test? You know, Call the function and see if you get the correct result. Okay. Uh, another example is this last one, the computing the square root. So for the square root, we assume that the number X is positive. 
for the homework, extend the function so that it works also for the case, oh, sorry, not positive, greater than one. So for square root, we need the function to be greater, to be, uh, to be positive, but it's greater than one. Extend it to the case where x is between zero and one and try writing it without using the math library. As another example, write a function that gets a list of numbers and returns the maximal number in the list. Yes, you can use simply the function max, but uh, try doing it without using max. And the last example, it's sort of similar to the example we saw uh, in, in one of the previous lectures. Write a function that gets a number n, and returns a string consisting of n stars. Okay, so for example, if you get seven, it just returns a string with seven stars. The function doesn't need to print anything, only needs to return. When you test it, you will actually print the result, but the function itself doesn't print anything. Okay, that's all for today. Thank you all. Bye.